Hello and welcome to It's Africa's Time. In episode 5, we review the broad-scale impacts of economic growth and poverty reduction interventions in Ghana, Zambia and Nigeria. In these emerging economies, foreign direct investment can bring positive effects, such as market access, finance, technology and expertise. But in order to be a force for sustainable social change, these investments must involve responsible business strategies, which improve improve skills and build local capacity as well. The United Nations has in its Millennium Declaration and along with its uh, Global Compact looked at business practices and tried to align them with universal uh, practices such as the Universal Human Declaration which looks at human rights, it looks at environmental law, it looks at labor practices. So I think what we need to do is to work with the government as well as with the United Nations agencies to see how we can make business practices uh, much more aligned to some of the universal principles. Ghana has a very strong economic situation. When you look at the macroeconomic figures, Ghana is very well positioned and it's seen as one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. It's lower middle income by statistics, but it's not a lower middle income society. So we still have a lot of development challenges despite its strong economic growth. For our first feature, we travel to Pakro in Ghana to visit the Water Treatment and Distribution Center jointly funded by the Coca-Cola Africa Foundation and Water Health International. This partnership aims to deliver sustainable and affordable access to safe drinking water to deprived communities in the region. Pakro has a, a countryside village. We were fetching water from um, the stream, Dinsu River. And then after some time, the government also provided some two boreholes. And these were the waters we were using. And um, it's one of the reasons why um, Coca-Cola partnered with Water Health to bring in this facility because there was also a number of um, waterborne diseases prevalent in this community and it's as a result of um, the contaminated water sources available. Water Health is a private commercial organization and has provided over 1,000 mini water treatment plants to peri-urban and rural communities around the world. Water is tapped from existing surface water or groundwater sources and in Pakro is sourced from the Densu River. A community agreement spells out the roles of the different stakeholders. It establishes the district assembly as legal custodian of the facility, whilst the community and its chiefs are the owners and Water Health the implementer. This land was donated by the community. Uh, in addition to that, the, in Ghana there's a community water and sanitation agency. We consult with them and work very closely with them to determine which communities we go into. Also, Water Health form these water boards and they jointly with the water boards decide what the usage fee for the water should be. Most people can afford to spend 5 US cents for 20 liters of water. Let's do a comparison. What people normally buy to use, to drink and use in their households is water in plastic pouches. Uh, a half a liter of the water in a plastic pouch costs 10 pesos. Half a liter costs 10 pesos, that's five US cents. What Safe Water for Africa aims to do is to create private sector partnerships to raise $20 million to provide access to safe, clean drinking water using the water health model for two million West Africans. It means saving, saving cost, it means improve health and for that matter, improve productivity and improve household income, especially in the Parkour area where uh, certain waterborne diseases have been identified. 
it is women and children when there's no water they are the people who suffer uh, most uh, they spend a lot of their time especially in the dry season going out fetching for water sometimes they even go and they have to sleep overnight digging river courses in order to get water uh, children are not able to go to school or even if they go to school you see them dozing because they have to rise up early in the morning and go and fetch water we have um a distribution system into about five schools in the community and what we do is that we just mount poly tanks at the various schools and then pump treated water to the schools. As we have the water in the school, their, their enrollment has increased. Coming to the health of the children, we can see that they are no more complaining about uh, sickness. Previously, we used to walk a long distance to the Dinsu River to collect water, bring it home and use it for our household activities. The water is helping us a lot. With respect to my family, when they finish eating, I give them some of the water from the Water Health Center to drink as well. We no longer get waterborne diseases. It has reduced uh, diseases such as diarrhea, blue ulcer, uh, typhoid fever, more enteric fever, and then kidney worm has been reduced. And even cholera, we've not recorded any cholera case ever since the water came to existence. So these days we don't have cases of school children coming here with diarrhea cases on and off because of the access to clean water. Those who don't have money to go and buy this, the, the water they've been selling, they now have access to clean water, which is for free. For every facility, we recruit three to five people from the community who are trained and they operate and man the facility. So in terms of businesses, um, for some of the communities, we have um, entrepreneurs coming to fetch the water and then also going to sell the water to others, which creates some small businesses. I fetch water for people and send to their houses for them to use for their household activities. With the Water Health Center, I am able to go quickly, fetch water and send to my clients because it is closer to me. I fetch more water for people. By that, I am making more money for myself. That the water situation in Ghana is uh, remarkably improving. We are actually getting nearer to safe water for all as per the MDG Section 7C. Government is putting in all efforts to ensure that we get to that mark. The Save Water for Africa's objective is to supplement or complement the, the work that our governments do to address uh, the challenges they face in water, sanitation, hygiene, education. Foreign direct investment is really recognized to have a very significant and a positive role in African economy. The positive effects I think are quite easy to see. The most important is improved human capital and this comes about through, for example, knowledge transfer. Uh, foreign direct investment companies bring in different ways of working, different management practices. They also bring in different uh, technologies, so there's also a technology transfer, skills, etc but also job creation because coming in they also bring in different types of jobs and that creates jobs in the economy. Um, foreign di direct investment also then makes the links to markets that wouldn't normally be present in the country. So there is this link to the local and the global um, as, as well as uh, creating competition in the country. So you're, you're also working towards increasing productivity. So there is actually quite a large number of positive effects. More than 60% of the labour force in countries across Africa work in agriculture. Yet the sector accounts for just 20% of the continent's gross domestic product. 
We're here in Zambia to see how agrofinance solutions can help small, medium and commercial farmers to secure the inputs they need for growing and multiplying their crops. We'll also learn how in the long run these solutions can increase agricultural gross product and help to enhance food security on a national level. CHC uh, was, was put together basically to provide services to agriculture, make it more efficient, make farming easier in the country. We help provide inputs to the farmer, funding to grow the crops, and then marketing services and storage for the crop when it's been grown. Greenbelt provides the inputs to the farmers, where they, they supply fertilizing chemicals, where CAC provides a marketing service and storage. And with the introduction now of crop finance, we also finance the farmers. So it works as a complete package. Stanchart has been a, a big partner in our lives. It, it helps us at all our stages. It helps us buy the fertilizer for the fertilizer company for Greenbelt. It is providing the funds to finance the farmers to grow the crops. And it also helps us on the output side. Once we put crops into sheds, then it gives us funding to help pay the farmers to buy the commodities. We deal with about 120 commercial farmers on a number of different levels and we also buy commodities, both sorghum and maize, from about 6,000 small-scale farmers. In promoting agricultural development, Standard Chartered provides two complementary financing solutions. One is the Finance Against Warehouse Receipts program, which facilitates the procurement of barley, maize, wheat or soya beans from Zambian farmers. CHC is a key client of this Standard Chartered program. The organization purchases commodities from the farmers and deposits them into a warehouse, overseen by a qualified collateral manager. The collateral manager then issues a warehouse receipt, upon which the bank will finance CHC at 80% of the value of the purchased commodity. The other is the Input Finance Program, which provides farmers with pre-finance to buy the crop inputs necessary for cultivation. Finance Against Warehouse Receipts is uh, uh, a program that uh, involves uh, the use of uh, secured uh, commodity as collateral for the loan, rather than uh, asking the client to provide us with uh, the physical security. For example, all we rely on uh, from the bank's uh, perspective is uh, the collateral itself that uh, we funding. We take security on the growing crops and the produce that comes uh, thereof. We put our commodities, the, the crop outputs, under warehouse receipt in, in, our, in our sheds and it helps two sectors. It helps the processors, it helps them buy their crop when the harvesters and when the prices are, are lower and then draw down throughout the year and pay for it as they need it. So the processors don't have to fund the entire crop as it comes off. And for the farmers who don't want to sell their crop, again, prices are a bit low at harvest. If they put in the warehouse, they can then get funding to continue their operations. When the prices improve, they can then sell their commodity. The Standard Chartered Input Finance is a new product for us. This is our first year of doing it. We select farmers with a track record that we feel confident can perform on what they promise. We're funding four different crops at the moment, maize and soybeans, wheat and barley. We provide all the inputs, fertilizer, chemicals, fuel. We pay for the electricity and the labor costs. We provide them with an agronomic service. We go and test their soils. We then supply them fertilizing chemicals specific to their needs. And then we provide them finance to grow that crop. And when the crop is ready, we provide a marketing service and get them paid at the best prices available. This hopefully increases the farmer's ability to grow more crops. So it makes Zambia produce more. This year, we've done about 20 farmers uh, to the value of about $5 million. We're hoping that this business will grow over the next two years to about a $30 million business. We finance our farming operations. Um, we've also got to finance the input costs, equipment purchases, development. The biggest input is probably fertilizer. Seed is a very important one, good genetics as well as good physical quality of the seed. Diesel is a big thing, equipment and uh, labor. 
Another very big input for, for winter cropping is water. The value provided to CHC is that, uh, you know, because the commodity is stored in the warehouses, we uh, sort of help CHC to provide the just-in-time uh, supply uh, to their uh, clients. I have uh, 16 family members that I use in the farm. And my farm is about 200 hectares. The money that I receive from my crop, I use it in, in uh, developing my land. I want to sink a bore so that uh, the water problem comes to an end. Yeah, I need water for my cattle during dry season uh, to walk long distances. I'm able to, to pay my workers at the right time because of uh, being getting paid early. And uh, I use the same money to take my children to school and uh, I am able to run my business very smoothly. If you look at Zambia, which is largely dependent on mining, we are trying to diversify and agriculture is increasingly becoming important. Agriculture accounts for 20% of Zambia's GDP, or to put it in value terms, $4 billion. In Zambia alone, we support over 750,000 small-scale farmers. And that is big, because that's really what the government is encouraging the banks to do, because these are the future commercial farmers. We believe that we're making farming far more profitable through our small-scale and commercial. The government doesn't need to subsidize agriculture as much as it does. It made Zambia um, a net exporter in all the major food products, which has brought the cost of food in the country down. It also, by encouraging exports, it is increasing the foreign exchange income to the country. So on a number of levels, I think we're, we're definitely uh, making a big impact on the economy. Government should actually create an enabling environment for good practices in foreign direct investment and this includes, for example, an enabling environment, I mean transparency, you know, you have to have predictability, um, procedures, administrative procedures, uh, rules and regulations on, on, for example, property ownership, uh, on taxation systems, on procurement rules. So I think that's where government's role really is, is to have that transparency and, and that predictability so that foreign companies do feel confident in investing and coming into another country. Nigeria is the leading economy of West Africa. It accounts for 10% of the region's GDP and is on its way to becoming one of the 30 biggest economies of the world. Its lack of transport infrastructure, however, poses a major obstacle to Nigeria's optimum business development. The Danish-based MERS Group have been investing in West Africa for over 60 years. And in 2006, a division of MERS called APM Terminals took over the port of Apapa in Lagos, Nigeria. Subsequent infrastructural investments of more than $300 million enabled improvements on a massive scale, and these upgrades facilitated the introduction of the WAF Max vessels. Today we visit the port of Apapa to find out more about these vessels and their social, economic and environmental impacts. WAFMAX vessels are especially suited for Lagos and, and West Africa in general because the ports typically suffer from uh, lower draft or depth of water than ports that you might see in Asia or in the US or, or Europe for example. The WAFMAX vessels are constructed to draw the minimum amount of water and maximise the amount of cargo that can be carried. As the leading container carrier in Africa, since the early 80s, Maersk Line has witnessed a significant growth in trade between Africa and the Orient. And today, around 50% of all goods arriving at Apapa originate from the Far East. As such, Maersk have ordered 22 WAFMAX vessels at a total cost of $2.1 billion to accommodate two weekly services, one into Nigeria and another into Ghana. First of all, the WAF Max vessels are much larger than any vessels that have previously called uh, West Africa. They can carry 4,500 containers, whereas prior to 2011, 
the largest vessels that came here could only carry 2,500 containers. So when you have larger vessels, you're able to deploy more cranes to work at the same time. That in turn increases the productivity, it improves the vessel turnaround time, and once you have no congestion, you were able to offer on-time delivery with a certain level of certainty. The difficulty in running a shipping service is not so much to, to sail the vessels from one port to another port. The key is actually to secure berths on arrival. Once you can do that, then you can offer a fixed service. When you have that, then the importers can adjust and optimize their supply chain around that. In the past, most of our importers have been carrying buffer stocks of up to two months because of unreliability, not in so much in terms of when the vessel will arrive, but in terms of when it will actually burst. Unlike other ships carrying such large volumes, the Wafmax vessels are significantly more self-sufficient. They are equipped with cranes designed to load and discharge in any West African terminal and are also fixed with bow and stern thrusters, which allow them to berth without relying on local tugs, which are often unavailable. The Wafmax vessels is but one small piece in a larger puzzle. So a lot of things that have to come to be together in order to truly optimize the supply chain and for Nigeria to realize its full potential. The Wafmax vessels will ensure that it becomes more economically viable to transport goods to and from Nigeria. What that means in practice is that Nigerian goods are going to become more competitive overseas. What it also means is that the cost of imported goods on the shelf in the supermarket will go down. We have had the independent economists in Copenhagen estimate and quantify the value in net incremental trade to Nigeria from the Wafmax vessels and it's been quantified $760 million in 2013. On a global level, container shipping is the most environmentally friendly way of transporting goods, but these logistics still have a significant carbon footprint. In addition, sulfur dioxide emissions contained in shipping fuel exhausts pollute clean air and impact on the health of the people who live in cities around the ports. The reduced turnaround time of WAFMAX vessels have enabled a 20% decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions per container. Further, the CO2 footprint of these vessels is 30% less than the industry average. Some of the obstacles which still remain uh, are related more to the, the land side operations. A container terminal can only be as efficient as the ability to evacuate containers, whether that's from the marine side or from the land side. At the moment, the condition of the roads, the infrastructure generally, and the availability of sufficient trucks and uh, warehousing solutions for, for importers are not where they need to be. And that means that unfortunately, many containers dwell or stay for, for uh, quite a long time in the port. And trade on its own drives economic growth. Now, without well-developed logistics sector, it is really difficult to realize the benefits of economic growth. Africa is lagging behind in this area, and it requires a lot of skills, capabilities, to be able to improve its logistical sector. We believe very strongly that the supply chain of today will be more beneficial to the country if we improve our collaboration, develop our infrastructure our facilities, and be in a position to actually take part in global supply chain um, of other products that find their way into the country. Our vision for APAPA is to create a, a world-class term. Efficient port operations and efficient terminals have a major uh, impact on any uh, country's economic welfare. The cost to import containers through an efficient port reduces the cost of goods in the marketplace or for the man in the street. Uh, additionally, for exporters it can be the difference in competitive advantage. You're faster to get your goods to market or you can do so at a lower cost than your competitor. When a country like Nigeria, an efficient port operation can be used as a hub for other uh, countries in West Africa as well.
think it's fair to say that international trade depends on two things, competitive ports and an efficient supply chain. The VAF marks and the terminals coming together, I think, will have a very important impact on the Nigerian economy. Thanks for joining us on It's Africa's Time. See you next month when we look at the interventions of three large companies and their significant community development impacts.